Welcome to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our two guests on the show today to kick off our Green Party of Canada leadership series that we are hosting on the Cross Border Interviews live. And they are Anna Keenan, Chad Walcott. Chad, Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. I am excited to talk about your leadership run, your co-leadership style, but also some policies that are affecting Canadians from coast to coast to coast here in the country. Thank you both for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Chris. So uh, anyone who's listened to the My Show before, they know the very first question that's going to come out of my mouth is duty to serve. Where does that come from? So this is going to be a roundtable discussion, as always. So we'll start with Anna on this question. Anna, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? It's a beautiful question. I really appreciate it. Um, I have had, I, I was reflecting on my my LinkedIn profile the other day and how um, for the last you know 15 years, I've had this statement at, uh, at the top of my profile on LinkedIn and on the top of my resume just saying, I'm constantly seeking to find a role where I can make the biggest difference for sustainability and social justice. And that really started for me, you know, after my years in, in university, I studied uh, science and economics in, in two degrees. And then at the end of, of my studies, I, I had these choices to make about, you know, what am I going to do after my studies? I, I could have gone on to do you know, a master's in science or something like that, but I was becoming more and more aware of the climate crisis and I realized that no matter how good a scientist I might become, it wasn't going to make a difference unless politicians started listening to scientists. And so, you know, I decided that's my calling. I'm going to move into politics because I see the, the warning signs coming and I want to shift the political system so that we're responding to this existential crisis. So that was about 15 years ago and I've been at it ever since. Well, I appreciate that. And what about yourself, Chad? Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, I guess I'm going to go back a bit farther. Like, uh, so I worked when I was about uh, 19, 20, well, up until 23, 24, I worked with kids at, at day camps and I had a good boss and mentor uh, at that time who kind of told us, look, at this job, it's not enough to just show up and play games. You have to push the envelope and you have to make these kids have a summer they're going to remember. And I think that's where my duty to serve kind of comes from. It's like this idea that in a leadership position, we have the role to inspire and make people dream. Um, so we started there with the kids. I was working with 11, 13 year olds, then, you know, seven, eight year olds and the whole, the whole breadth of kids that go to day camp. Uh, and I kind of took those lessons with me when I got to university and started getting involved in uh, student government. And that's when I kind of was able to take those concepts and really apply them to representing uh, both my faculty association back in 2010, 2011 and 2012, uh, 2011, 2012, the whole university. Um, and, and yeah, that's where, you know, the duty to like, have integrity, be honest, take negative feedback and, and try to improve myself and always push the limits of what is possible and always push the limits of inspiration. Uh, that's, that's where it kind of came from for me. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> no, and I appreciate you both answering that question because I, I always find it fascinating to hear where that duty to serve comes from. And we have so many great people who put their name forward in many different levels of government, and they all have their reason to do that. So even that brief um, uh, description for yourself uh, tells me a lot about who you both are. But we could talk about duty to serve for an hour just in itself, but people are tuning in and listening because they want to know who these two people are who are running as a joint leadership campaign under the uh, Keenan Walcott uh, 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 frame of a Green Party of Canada leader co-leadership. So I I'm going to start my basic line of questioning with this. How did this partnership come about? How did Anna and Chad get together one day and decide, you know what, we need to do this together? Uh, who wants to take that question? Because uh, it is an open-ended question, and I'm assuming you'll be going back and forth. But let's start. Who wants to take that question? I, I can jump into that. I, I think that's where the story starts. So um, I've run in the last two federal elections on Prince Edward Island, um, and I did quite well in those elections. And so it was, you know, literally on election night last year, I had people telling me, you know what, Anna, like after this difficult year for the Green Party, you should be stepping up. We believe in you. We think that you should be running for Green Party leader. 
And I said to myself, you know, I'm not sure that I speak French well enough. And even a year of work, I, you know, j'ai amélioré mon français uh, <laughs> très bien l'année passée. I've worked hard, but um, I know it's not going to be at the level needed to serve the francophone community. My husband is bilingual. My son goes to a French school, but I really knew that it was time for the Green Party to, to truly serve both linguistic communities in Canada equally. And I'm from Australia originally. I have friends in the New Zealand Greens. I've worked in Europe. Many of the Green parties in Europe and indeed many of the other political parties in Europe also use co-leadership. And having spoken with many of uh, the co-leaders of those parties and the governance experts, they say, once a political party transitions to, to joint leadership, you'll never go back because there's advantages for the leader themselves, for the party, for the culture of politics in the country. So I knew back in January, I wanted to make uh, this, this step and to do it together with someone. And uh, I started asking around my friends in the Quebec Greens, you know, who would you recommend to work with? And Chad Walcott's name just kept coming up. So I reached out. Yeah. And uh, so Anna and I met about in February, we started talking about the possibility of, of running together and we kind of like co-vetted each other throughout like a two week process where we met and and uh, yeah, just discuss policy issues, controversial, non-controversial, like everything, the whole spectrum. And at the time when Anna approached me, I had also kind of been approached by a few people in Quebec being like, you should do this, you should do this. But the timing was kind of weird for me. I had just proposed, you know, so we're planning a wedding. Uh, I had just bought a condo. So, you know, I put all my money into that. Uh, so I wasn't sure that now was necessarily the best time. But after after talking with Anna a bunch and seeing how much we aligned and kind of agreeing that now is really the time for the Green Party to take it to the next level and, and propose something new and kind of unseen in federal politics before, it became clear that yeah, it's we have to go now because the way the our, our political climate's going in Canada, you know, there's a lot of disillusionment, there's a lot of anger, and we feel like our message and our kind of way of operating can cool down the temperature a bit and bring back that kind of cordiality and conversation and debate to the political uh, arena. And we hope to do that with our candidacy, and we also hope with our co-leadership model to kind of get people talking. About different ways of doing politics in Canada, about proportional representation, about the importance of participatory and grassroots democracy. So, uh, so yeah, so we decided that this was a good plan to go forward. On my end, in terms of like background and working on co-leadership, um, you know, it's something that a few of us Quebec Greens were were a model we were looking at to bring to the Quebec Green Party. Actually, should uh, a change in leadership you know occur. Uh, so when Anna approached me with that possibility at the federal level, I was like, you know what? Yeah, this makes sense. Why why start provincially when we can go straight to the top? <laughs> so I, I, I followed politics most of my adult life. And even in when I was about 10, 13, when I was raised in Ontario, um, I was one of those kids who had uh, posters of premiers and prime ministers on the wall where other people had cars. So I have followed politics a very long time. This is a unique position that you are introducing into the Green Party of Canada, but also federally as a co-leadership. Um, I have... I, I know there are co-leaderships around the world and there are parties who run nationally or uh, provincially or locally with co-leaderships and one person would run for office and one person would be outside of politics and not be an elected official. How does this uh, version of a co-leadership under uh, your team work? Would it be both of you running to be seat, have seats in the House of Commons? Because we all know... There's only one person who would be elected prime minister of Canada. So how does a co-leadership race or candidacy work if you were to be chosen as the next prime minister of Canada? Because would it be co-prime ministers? So uh, uh, right now, to, you know, to go towards co-prime ministers would probably require a whole change of the constitution, right? So we understand that there are limitations to our model should we become government, but that's totally a problem that we're excited to have. Uh, but in that framework, we would probably, one of us would assume the role as prime minister, the other would probably deputy prime minister. And as we see with the liberals, with uh, Justin Trudeau and Christian Freeland, you know, the deputy prime minister can have a lot of files and, and effectively kind of run the country, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in lieu of the prime minister. So that's how we would do it. And, and we were looking to a model similar to that of Quebec Solidaire, where um, 
what they're doing is kind of trading off responsibilities mandate to mandate or even every two years, right? So the leader, as we know of the, of the Canadian political system, our prime minister is simply the leader of the political party with the majority in parliament. So there's no, it's unlike the, the American system where you elect directly a president. We, I think we'd be able, there's, there's room there to kind of switch off responsibilities uh, depending on the time, depending on what kind of, which particular style of leadership is most needed from us at the time. And, uh, and I'll add to that that the um, the German Greens are one example where both of the co-leaders are elected and they're actually part of coalition government. They both have ministerial files. Um, but going into each election, the co-leaders have a discussion between them and they say, OK, when it comes to being the spokesperson for the party in debates, which one of us is it going to be? And if we had the fortune of forming government, which I think the Green Party is at least a few elections away from, you know, who would be taking that that first seat among equals? Where does the co-leadership fit into today's society? Because right now the Green Party does not have a co-leadership position. Um, I, I know on your website, which the link is in the show notes for anyone who wants to go check out policy positions for this amazing team, you do talk about uh, what you will do. One person will win the leadership race and the other person will be appointed deputy uh, leader right away and then hopefully change the constitution of the party later on. Um, it's a unique position to run in a campaign where you're running as individuals, but you're running as a team. So when you're talking to Green members, and I know we're only a week after the announcement of the uh, names, are people excited to potentially have a co-leadership in the Green Party of Canada? What are you hearing from uh, uh, members from coast to coast to coast about this proposed idea that you have put in forth, uh, front of them? Yeah. P people are definitely very excited. Um, we're getting a lot of positive energy, a lot of feedback, people saying, you know, oh, my, like my little green heart is beating again. That was my favorite <laughs> comment that we got from, <laughs> from the last week. Um, but co-leadership was actually put forward by uh, other members of the Green Party to our last general meeting. And there was a really robust discussion in a policy workshop. Um, I, I attended that workshop. Um, and even though the motion was voted against because it, it had like a very specific wording to change the constitution, the, the majority of members in that workshop said, we support this idea. We just think that um, it needs more development and more thinking. And like, we need to not only change this one clause of the constitution, we also need to change like three or four other clauses so the specific proposal that went to the last general meeting needed more work and that's why it was it didn't pass um, but the, there was a huge sense from the members in the room that this is uh, a great model to move towards it's a great model to move towards for just like any political party even in unilingual countries but in Canada in particular um, our, our two official languages I think it does provide um, a real advantage because then you get the benefit of leaders who might only belong to one linguistic community and, and need a bit more time to, to fully develop their bilingualism. Yeah, and we think, we feel as though this response to the Green Party values in a, in a better way than the single leader model, right? One of the main, or one of the pillars of, of our, our Green values is participatory democracy, right? So to have it to do kind of devolve power into two people who are then our plan is to really invest in our membership, invest in our, our mobilizing capacity, I think, you know, is more reflective of green values and more reflective of what members want to see um, in their leadership. Yeah, we don't really believe in the the cult of personality and like this really egocentric politics, um, green policies about democracy in general, really want to empower like every member of the parliament. Right now, you know, there's, there's dozens and dozens of representatives who just like happily sit on the back, back bench and they take orders from uh, their party leader about how to vote and you know really returning to the sense of parliamentary democracy um, so that it's all 338 representatives that are making decisions together I think that would be healthy and it would maybe give Canadians more of a sense that they as citizens have individual power and that the government will respond um, you know their their views will be represented in parliament. Um, the last question on this subject before we turn to my favorite part of these interviews is policy. I love policy talk. I love chatting about policy. But uh, you probably have filled this question already, but I'm going to get you on the record for my show just to make sure that people know who are tuning in and tuning in later. Um, not 
two people never think alike on 100% of the issues. Uh, Chad, Anna, you were probably going to disagree on one particular issue or the way forward on one particular issue. How does uh, uh, Walcott Keenan uh, co-leadership address that part of the co-leadership uh, model that you're putting forward? Is it uh, go into a back room and duke it out? Or is it just having a civil conversation and may the best person win or putting it forward to the members? How does uh, the issues that face Canadians day to day that you may disagree on get settled between a co-leadership team like yourself? Right. So uh, that's a very good question and, and a valid one. So what we've decided is that should there be a policy issue or an issue that really we can't come to terms with and we can't solve on our own, we've kind of brought together a, an advisory board that will help us uh, of three with, with an additional fourth if, if need be. Um, that will help us. So we would take that issue, we'd explain each of our points of view to this advisory board and let them have a conversation about what is the best way forward, right? If they're able to come to a consensus, then we we'd reflect that consensus in our decision making and and move forward that way if they're not able to have a consensus you know they'd, they'd have a vote ultimately um the the accountability would fall on us to have the take this decision whatever it may be uh whether i win the debate whether anna wins the debate whether we find hopefully a compromise solution to move forward and and remain united in our in our support of that direction um yeah did you want to add anything yeah, on that? I'll, I'll i'll add to that that um you know, Chad and I actually have already had uh, one serious disagreement in the last, uh, what, eight months of working together. Um, and we talked through it, you know, we and we, we resolved it between ourselves. And it, I think it actually like deepened our trust in each other. Um, it's, you know, it's like having, I, I, I'll use the term official best friend, like to, to be in a co-leadership relationship, it's like having an official best friend within this professional relationship. Um, that was that was a term that the former leader of the co-leader of the Greens of England and Wales used to me. Um, and you're committed to your your friendships, and this is like a key relationship. So I don't want this relationship to break up over a disagreement. Um, we know how to work through uh, disagreements together and to find the best solutions. In that instance, we found a solution that we were happy with and that we've remained committed to. Um, and if we do have to go to our advisory board. The, the public is never actually going to know about that. That's a confidential process that, that we commit to. And it's Chad and I who are going to be the ones who present the results of that and say we're both standing by this decision. Um, so we've, we, I think we've lined up the processes to have backups. Hopefully we never need to use the advisory board, but it's our sort of like go-to emergency if, uh, if we can't resolve something between ourselves, which I trust we'll, we'll be able to do in 99% of situations. Yeah, I think it's it's about the ability to be able to have difficult conversations and still be able to work together, right? And that's a, a core principle of, of our campaign and, and our leadership style is like, we're never going to agree on every single issue. Fund, like, we could disagree on a fundamental level, but we need to be able to sit down and talk to each other in, in a calm and, and respectful way and come to a consensus or come to a compromise that uh, works for both of us or makes both of us a little bit unhappy as compromise often does. Um, but it's important and it's important to have, to be able to do that in the larger political context as well. We need to be able to sit down with the NDP, with the liberals, with the conservatives and have spirited debates that remain respectful and try to find common ground to move forward on. And I think, uh, yeah, we want to lead by example, right? And that to go back all the way to the first question of like our duty to serve, it comes from a, a desire to lead by example. Um, and we want to we want to try to do that. Yeah. And and we've got that work to do within the Green Party as well. There are different groups within the Green Party that want to go in different directions. And we want to be unity leaders that that demonstrate and that promote the idea of working together, even through difference. And I think that's what's needed to strengthen and solidify the Green Party to recover after a very, very difficult year <laughs> last year and to ultimately get to the point of um, you know, taking responsibility and, and getting results um, in terms of winning seats in Canadian Parliament. Okay, I was going to talk about policy, but Anna, you just mentioned something that I, I want to play in this, that, that sandbox for a few minutes, if you're okay with me. And that is the difference of opinions, because uh, we saw in the last uh, election and in the last few months, the Green Party has been in a, a odd position, I'll, I'll say that kindly. Um, 
how do you balance that? Because you will be putting forward a vision for the party and there are people out there who may not agree with that vision for the party. Once once you both become leader or one of you become leader, one deputy leader and then co-leader once the constitution is changed, how will you address what is going on in the party? But also how do you address the different positions the party has? Because if you talk to a Green in Alberta, you talk to a Green in Ontario, you talk to a Green out in Nova Scotia or PEI or Quebec, you're going to hear something different from each one of them about certain issues. How do you see your role as leaders to mold the differences of opinions and bring them into a message that Canadians can unite behind? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's about listening and it's about empowerment. So we get a lot of feedback. Like in the last uh, in the last week, people say, "Oh, I've seen your video. I think you should have said this differently. I think you should have said that differently." And of course, different members have different ideas about the directions that we should be going. So we're trying to listen to what everybody is telling us. The feedback we're getting from multiple directions, integrate that and try to find you know a balanced path that um, the majority of members can get behind. And I, I'm really excited by the support that we're getting from younger Greens as well, who've uh, felt a little unheard in the party for some time. And I really believe that by uniting the, the generational values of millennials and Gen Z with the traditional environmentalist values of the, the older generation in the party, that we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna become this like unstoppable intergenerational force for change. So it's about listening but then it's also about empowerment. I don't wanna be, and we don't wanna be, the sort of leaders who are micromanaging and trying to control what members are saying. You know, we want to support everybody's leadership across the country. And if we're going to grow the party, we need to let go of control and instead support people's ambition. If somebody wants to run a full ambition campaign, um, you know, we should be giving them support. We should be enabling them to access resources, to access training, to, you know, a, a lot of the, um, the expertise that I've brought into my own campaigns here on Prince Edward Island, I gained from my experience outside of the Green Party in the nonprofit campaigning sector with Greenpeace, with 350.org, with avaz.org. Those organizations taught me how to do citizen engagement. And I brought that skill into the party and that's why I've had success. And like Elizabeth has similar experience, Mike Morris, you know, Paul Manley, they've brought their own experience. We need to be um, creating the Green Party as an institution that gives that experience, that gives that training to the people across the country wanting to make a difference. And so if you're a Green in Alberta, I trust that you are the best person to communicate Green values to the Albertan community. If you're a Green in Prince Edward Island, you know, you, you know how to communicate to your community. So it's about trusting people to connect with the specific values of their own local community. Um, it's not about, you know, us as leaders doing that for every community across the country. We, we want to lift up the leaders that already exist across the whole country. Yeah, it's about applying the principles of leading from behind, right? It's you you set a you set a destination, you all agree on the direction you want to go, and you let the experts, the regional experts, if we're talking about places like different places in Canada, lead in their own way um, and give them the resources to shine and, and build leaders and lift them up uh, so that you know the Green Party can be relevant in every every region of the country that needs to be and, and that every group with diverging priorities within the Green Party feels a, an, an ability to contribute to the overall growth and direction of the party. I, I appreciate the answer on that question. But uh, as I said, I, I enjoy the policy question. So we're going to turn to the policy questions here for a few seconds here. Um, and I want to start off with one that is uh, important to a lot of Albertans because we have seen over the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, and us coming up on the second anniversary of the National Truth and Reconciliation Day on September 30th, um, Aboriginal and First Nations uh, relations with our federal government. Uh, while you are relatively new in the leadership race, this is only a week into the leadership race, you have both ran uh, campaigns in the past and in you have been your name has been on the ballot. Where do you see the Green Party helping foster the relationship between Canada and our First Nations communities here in Alberta, in Ontario, in Quebec, PEI, up in uh, Northwest Territories? Chad, do you want to take that one? 
Sure. I think I, it obviously needs to come start from a place of like recognition of the impact that the Canadian government has had on these communities in the past, you know, uh, recognizing the damage we've done, uh, the intergenerational damage we've done through residential schools, through uh, policies like the White Papers and the Indian Act that are designed to still today assimilate these, these communities into Canada, despite the fact that a lot of the times these communities don't identify as Canadians and don't want to be Canadians um, in, in certain cases. In other cases, they do. But it's about bringing these voices forward and letting them speak for themselves rather than trying to speak on their behalf and dictate what truth and re reconciliation really looks like. Um, so yeah, I, I think it starts with an honest recognition of the damage that we've done and raising the leaders of these communities to, to speak for themselves and help guide us in how we how we move to a place of, of trust again, how we move to a place of uh, healing. Um, so have you started you know, that conversation? Have... Sorry to interrupt, but have you guys both started that conversation? Because you have a very short time frame to become the next leaders. And after that, we are in a minority situation. We could be at an election by all Twitter accounts. We all believe what Twitter says because that's the end all be all of what happens in this world. But we could be in an election in this fall, next spring. You will have a very short time frame to start making those connections with our First Nations and Indigenous communities. Have you started that process already? I can say in in my writing, like I've always made it a, a priority to make sure that one of the first communities that I go and knock on the doors of is, you know, the reserve that's that's within my community. I try to maintain good relations with uh, the Mi'kmaq leadership um, in Prince Edward Island. And I have really great respect for the the indigenous leaders that we have within the Green Party. We have, uh, you know, on our federal council right now, there are four really amazing and powerful indigenous women from across the country. Um, there's a recent innovation within the party uh, to introduce the, the indigenous people's advisory circle. And that's a formal element of our governance now. And I wanna make sure that we're lifting up the voices of people like Crystal Brooks in Ontario and uh, Lorraine Reckman's our president and Russell Coy, who's run for the party in, in British Columbia in the past. I think that um, you know, we're, we're really going through um, an indigenous renaissance right now. And the, the I, I, I'm a big fan of the work of Jody Wilson-Raybould uh, in, in popularizing the idea that we need to transition away from the Indian Act style of, of colonial governance for indigenous communities and to reinvigorate self-governance um, and help them to return to or su support them as they do the work of returning um, to their uh, governance systems adapted for you know their their modern context and it's going to be a process um, I'm excited to see the way that uh, tr the truth and reconciliation process plays out over the next 10 and 20 years I think it it provides a huge opportunity for Canada to also consider how can we shift our values base you know our dominant culture has largely been very individualistic about sort of borders and land rights and like uh you know the, the right of individuals to do what they want with their land and indigenous communities look at the land as as a collective and as part of um you know part of the society part of them um part of ourselves and these are this is a, a philosophy that's very in line with the core values of the green party itself so i i believe that by listening to and empowering Indigenous voices. It's not only a benefit for those communities, but it's also part of listening to that wisdom and driving cultural change across across all of Canadian society. And I, I do apologize, Chad, for interrupting you there. It's just you, you said something that I wanted to uh, jump on, so I just didn't want to forget about it in two minutes if, uh, once you were done your statement. So I do apologize right now. No problem. So just in case... No anyone, need to apologize. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised at how much attacks I get for doing this show from time to time about interrupting people. So I just want to say I do apologize that I did interrupt you. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick on this uh, uh, same track here. Um Chad, we are coming up, like I said, to the second Truth and Reconciliation Day here in Canada. Um, there are still calls for the implementations of all recommendations in the tr Truth and Reconciliation. Um, where do you, where does your team, where does the Green Party fall on this issue? Should we be implementing more of these recommendations that have been put forward in the paper? 
I think we should. I think, um, you know, the recommendations are intended, you know, to to try to seek that kind of restorative justice and, and healing between our communities. And I think um, to hold back on them and to find excuses not to implement, uh, you know, one of the Green Party's policies is to repeal the Indian Act, right? The Indian Act, which dictates who is considered to be First Nations and who is not, that dictates if you marry outside of your uh, your community, you you and you're a woman, you can potentially lose your status as a First Nations member. I think that's a, these are harmful policies. I think they still harken back to our colonial days, and we need to take a hard look into the mirror and start moving away from that and and recognize, as I said before, the damage that we have done and are continuing to do to uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities. You know, we still see in these communities high rates of suicide. They, there's so many water, boil water advisories still in effect that the government is, I mean, not acting on, right? They say they're acting on it, but what what changed? How many, you know, boil water, uh, boil water advisories are still in effect and have not been lifted yet. Uh, why is it that there's an over-representation of uh, Indigenous people in our, our criminal justice system? Um, or why are there more, uh, you know, we're still removing children from their parents, right, in these communities. There's a higher rate of, um, of children in the, in the kind of uh, child, I want to say child welfare, but the, uh, I can't think of it. Yeah, the foster care system. Thank you, honestly. This is why two people is good. Um, so <laughs> um, so there, there's so much more work that we need to do in order to, in, to undo the damage that we're currently doing and to engage with these communities in a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, framework. So yes, we should be implementing more of the recommendations. We should be implementing them more and faster because uh, it's, it's what's right to do. I, I appreciate. I, oh, go ahead, Anna. I, I'll jump in because this, I, this is the great thing. About I was the show. just going to add. Like, I was going to add one of the one of the things that we get from um, fully implementing the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is, you know, very beautiful ideas like restorative justice. Um, and restorative justice is a concept that originally entered into. Um, you know, the, the Canadian criminal justice system through work with Indigenous communities and their traditional and cultural approaches to healing after, um, after crime and after pain. And those teachings, I think like that it, it was just a beautiful example, like restorative justice now in, in my province of Prince Edward Island is now part of the general um, approach to, to criminal justice beyond the Indigenous community. And that I think is a, is a beautiful example of how we can learn from traditional indigenous values to improve, um, you know, the, the first part of reconciliation is to make sure that we're undoing the harms and we're creating justice for them, but it's also gonna make everybody's lives in Canada better as those values shift. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna turn now to an issue that is affecting everyone in this country, and that is affordability. Affordability, affordability, affordability. Inflation is at an all-time high. It's not as its highest as it's been over this last year, but it's at an all-time high. We have seen the Bank of Canada come out earlier this week with an interest rate hike, which means that mortgages are going to cost more, things are going to cost more in this country. Um, looking at the struggles that Canadians are going through right now and everyone of this country is going through, how do we start the conversation to addressing the issues around affordability and tackling the issue of inflation when it comes to your leadership? What are the, some of the priorities that you believe need to be implemented today to start addressing these issues so that way people have more money in their pocketbooks, but also people aren't scraping by and living paycheck to paycheck and taking out loans at the bank and causing them to have more mental health, which is a strain on the health care capacity. So how do we address the affordability crisis in this country right now? Who wants to, Chad? You, oh, who wants to? No, no, I'm passing it to Anna on this one. I spoke at length. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are, there are multiple parts of the inflation problem. If we just pretend that, you know, it's a simplistic solution, I think we're, we're off track. Um, housing is one major area. Um, energy and especially gas um, is another. 
Um, you've got food, which is a whole other area, and then you've got wages. And there are solutions across all of these, which Greens have been advocating for for a long time, which could have avoided us getting into this, this situation. So Greens, one of the things I love about being a Green is that we take a long-term approach and like, a, what would a sustainable system be? But because we've failed to invest in, for example, public housing, or um, local uh, food supply systems. And we become ever more dependent on global food supply chains, which are now being disrupted due to war and due to the climate crisis, because we've remained dependent on global oil supply instead of decentralized renewable energy systems and public transportation, um, because we've you know, failed to regulate the housing market, invest in public housing, and, and because we don't have livable minimum incomes, like it's just created vulnerabilities in terms of affordability across our entire economy. So when we are dependent on a rental market that has, you know, total deregulation, very little public investment, um, it's seen as an investment opportunity. Prices are driven up and people have no other option available to them but to remain in that market um, with that rental drain on their pocketbooks. When we don't have public transport, people can't choose to switch from their you know, gas car that they're pumping hundreds of dollars into per month. There's no feasible alternative. Like when I lived in Europe or even when I lived in Australia, I had the option to not own a car and I had a beautiful life. I could get around and like get to everywhere I needed to go without the financial drain of owning a car. Um, but we haven't built those alternatives in Canada. And that's one of the reasons that we're so dependent on these, these huge drains of, of money as uh, prices are, are pushed up. I know that Chad has more to say on this, so I'll let him. I, I, I'm gonna interrupt here for a second because uh, we just got word that Queen Elizabeth has passed away peacefully. Um, so the king consort, uh, queen and uh, king and queen consort are still at Balmoral, surrounded by uh, former Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I just wanted to break that in for those who are listening. Uh, sad day in Canada, sad day in the Commonwealth, and I do apologize for interrupting that. It's just I've been watching the story, and anyone who knows me knows I'm a monarchist, true and true. So, the Queen Elizabeth <laughs> has passed away at the age of ninety six today. So. Um, chat around affordability and housing uh, and wages. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about that. Continue on. I do apologize for interrupting there. No problem. And it, and it is a sad day that, you know, it's, it's sad that the Queen died. And, uh, you know, our condolences to the royal family and, and to all those who support the monarchy in, in the Commonwealth. Uh, it is, is certainly a loss. Um, but on affordability, uh, we need to shift our mindset from housing as an investment opportunity to housing as a right, first and foremost, right? Um, I, we think that spe you know the current real estate market speculation is, is what is kind of pushing this, uh, or what we said, the, the kind of uh, fire real estate market that we saw in, in Montreal, uh, in Vancouver, in Toronto. Uh, you know, we need to do something to quell that, to make, again, whether it's taxing speculation, whether it's outright banning, we need to regulate the market a bit more and, and invest as a government in more affordable housing for uh, so that everyone can can house themselves. Right? We have uh, in Vancouver, there's a crazy homeless crisis right now. Uh, my brother was just there a few weeks ago, and he was talking about uh, certain streets where both sides of the street are lined with with ten cities, right? And people can't afford to even rent. Uh, it, it's crazy a three and a half in Montreal uh, where housing, you know, apartments are supposed to be affordable or is now 15, $1,600 a month. So one bed, basically a one bedroom apartment. And it's, we have to do something to address this. We have to do something to reduce the price and make it more affordable uh, for people. And we, so we have to regulate and, and find ways to stop speculation uh, on wages. We need to look, uh, I'm going to talk about wages and, and oil prices kind of in tandem, right? Um, right now, one of the main factors driving our inflation is the cost of oil, right? The cost of gas at the pump. And while regular Canadian, everyday Canadians are struggling to pay their bills to fill up their cars, we're seeing oil companies, you know, making record profits that, that have never been seen before, right? We need to be bold enough to uh, tax those companies heavily and regulate the market so that they cannot benefit on crises for everyday Canadians. It doesn't make any sense. Um, 
And we have to use those taxes to then reinvest in our housing market, reinvest in, in creating an economy that puts the well-being of its citizens before profit and before you know productivity. And, and right now that isn't the model and we need to start making that shift and we need to be bold enough to have those conversations with Canadians and show them that it's in their best interest to move away from a profit worship model to a, a caring economy where that, that puts, yeah, like I said, people first and turns housing into a right. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here for a second because it, it jumps on Please to do. the next topic of uh, uh, <laughs> they will say people will yell at their screen or yell at this if they're listening to this uh, later on and say, well, how do you move to a caring economy when if people don't have jobs, if you tax companies, if you tax corporations more, uh, they won't hire more workers. They won't hire more uh, staff to do these things, which will cause people to lose their jobs or potentially not get the jobs that they're looking for. And then we may have even more cause to see more people who are homeless because people aren't working. How do we become a caring economy when we are living in a society where corporations will hold the purse strings and say, if you tax us more, we're not going to uh, hire any more people because we just can't afford it right now. Even though we are making records profits, we got to look at our bottom line at every single turn. And if you tax us, we're not going to hire more. So how do we do that? Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. So in the Canadian economy right now, we don't have a shortage of jobs. We have a shortage of labor. There are abundant jobs that are available, especially in the trades. And like you can work in construction, in uh, electrical, in plumbing, in you know, all sorts of things. There's a huge doctor shortage. There are nurses shortage. There are shortage, shortages of psychologists and social workers. Like we have good jobs that contribute to the caring economy that are available. I'm a, a huge fan of uh, the organization, you know, we are on an Alberta show here, so the, the organization Iron and Earth, um, which is working with uh, people who are employed in the tar sands industry, the oil sands industry, um, who are looking to make a transition. And, you know, they, they show that two thirds of people who are working in the, the oil and gas sector in Canada are interested in making job transitions. And what, what the government has sort of failed to do is to speak honestly with these people to pass just transition legislation the government has had to be pushed and pushed and pushed on this and they're still not delivering but like how can we invest in job transitions and retraining for these very skilled and very intelligent workers to find good jobs largely in their own communities as well like as i've gone door to door in the last elections i meet people who are fly in fly out workers from the maritimes to alberta and they don't love it you know, yes, they're being paid a very high salary, but a large chunk of that salary goes to the travel and they have to spend half the time away from their family. Meanwhile, those same skills um, could, you know, and that, that expertise and that labor could be being applied um, for building affordable housing right here in Prince Edward Island where we need it. And that same dynamic is, is true all across the country. Um, we want to be honest with you know, the, the, the workers in Alberta and our energy sector. Um, it is, it's disingenuous for the current government to say, you know, we've got your back and the oil industry is going to be around another 20 and 30 years. Like, that's just not true. Our, our climate can't handle it. If we want to, you know, my, my husband actually spent his teenage years in, in Banff. And like, if we want to protect tourism and our natural areas in Alberta, if we want to protect the farmland in Alberta that you know, farmers have been facing climate crisis after climate crisis every summer for the last multiple summers, um, if we want to protect those critical sectors of Canada's economy and Alberta's economy, it is just a scientific fact that the oil and gas sector needs to go through a managed decline. Um, I'm from the Maritimes. Newfoundland had uh, the collapse of the cod fishery and it wasn't prepared for, and it was disastrous for the economy. If we fail to prepare for the, the coming transition uh, in our energy sector, it is going to be disastrous for workers and their communities. But if we plan, if we look to the great examples of where there have been managed declines and managed closures, um, there have been multiple examples of that in Canada and uh, around the world, then we can make sure that we're um, delivering for our kids and grandkids while also taking care of workers in the present, helping them to find meaningful jobs that contribute to the green economy moving forward. 
just just a clarification here, just from my uh, my perspective, because I am the Alberta show and the Alberta host, and uh, I guarantee you there's an Alberta listening to this right now yelling at me. Um, <laughs> managed decline. That seems like something that is not saying you're for closing down the oil and gas sector here in Alberta tomorrow, but it could be in the future 10, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Can you take me through what you mean by managed decline? Because if Jason Kenney is listening to this right now, I've just seen the tweet that has gone out and saying Green Party is attacking our oil and gas sector again. Uh, what do you mean by managed decline? Yeah. Well, we, oh, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we, need to, we need to start transitioning to uh, more renewable energies, right? So to do that, we need to work on retraining our workers in the oil and gas industry to, you know, transition to the, a greener economy, to transition to greener sources of energy, uh, you know. So that's kind of what we mean by a managed decline. It's about, yes, reducing our dependency on fossil fuels, while also not abandoning the workers in the fossil fuel industry and helping them to transition to jobs uh, that, that fall into a greener economy that fall into the future, right? Canada has an opportunity to be a leader in, in, in clean energy uh, in the world, right? And we're kind of neglecting, we're leaving that opportunity by the wayside by continuing to just double down on, on industries that we know are um, hastening climate change and that are kind of making the, the climate disaster worse. So we have, um, yeah, we have an opportunity to be a world leader in clean energy and solar energy and wind energy. Uh, and we have the people power to, you know, uh, populate these jobs and, and, and retrain people for them while, you know, again, not tomorrow shutting off the pipe and being like, okay, you know, here's a, learn a new job, but gradually over years, retraining these, uh, these workers and investing in the future of our economy, because we, we can't sustain this kind of um, energy ex exploitation at this point. It really, yeah, go ahead, Anna. And, oh, oh, just, sorry, you just want to jump in and I just, you might be able to answer this as well, Anna, because it is a topic that uh, I know uh, there's at least four or five people who listen to the show who always ask this question right afterwards, but, uh, and they asked it during our live interview with Jordan Wilkie, the leader of the Green Party of Alberta, and that is around nuclear. Uh, uranium exploration in Saskatchewan is a big exporter. Uh, in Ontario, they have uh, Darlington and Pickering, which some are being, uh, Pickering is uh, close to being offline here soon. Darlington is getting refurbished. And then uh, Premier's Sus uh, Kenny, Moe, and Higgs out in New Brunswick all said that they want to bring in small nuclear uh, modules so that way uh, it is a other type of uh, energy that we're looking at. What is your position on uh, nuclear uh, energy, but also continue on with what your statement was. Yeah. So you know, it should come as no surprise the Green Party is consistent in this. And I think all, all Green Party leadership candidates will be aligned on this. Um, nuclear energy is, is not the way forward. Um, it is expensive. It relies on abundant supplies of fresh water. And in an increasingly climate changed world, that is not a guarantee. Um, it presents security risks. You're seeing that in, in Ukraine right now. Um, and in a world of increased climate catastrophe, we could do with a few less you know, ticking time bombs that, that present those sorts of risks. It, it also requires uh, you know, waste storage for 100,000 years into the future. That's beyond you know, the ability of, of you know, a human mind to comprehend. You know, our lifetimes are less than 100 years. And how can we plan for a thousand generations in the future to care for toxic radioactive waste? Um, so I don't believe that it is, it is the way forward. There's also you know, significant uh, environmental challenges at the point of uranium extraction um, and often uh, indigenous resistance to uh, to those mines as well. So, um, you know, I, I'm originally from Australia, like the there are significant uranium mines on indigenous land in Australia that have um, been uh, protested for decades <laughs> as well. And I, I'm not a believer that the, the nuclear cycle um, around the world contributes to global peace and security and and prosperity. I think we can I think we can do without it. Um, but in in terms of uh, managed decline that we were speaking about before, like we need to have the courage to regulate. Um, we need to set uh, a carbon budget that is in line with science. So the idea of a carbon budget is to say, okay, 
science tells us that if we want to keep to 1.5 degrees of global warming, which is about the level at which our agricultural systems could keep up and adapt before going into um, you know, spiraling crisis every year. Um, if we want to keep to that level, then we can emit you know, this much carbon over the next 10 years. And then um, you regulate and you do not allow expansion of the, the um, oil and gas industry beyond that amount. You, you tighten and tighten the regulations around oil and gas uh, companies. And if they're unable to comply with it, you make sure that there are compliance mechanisms um, to keep them in line. Because if we don't have those compliance mechanisms, then you know, we'll, we'll sort of do what we've done the last 20 years, where we promise big ambitious reductions. But, you know, Canada's emissions have not declined at all in the last 20 years, neither under Stephen Harper nor under Justin Trudeau, despite Justin Trudeau proclaiming himself as some great champion of climate action. We actually have not seen results if you look at our national emissions. And that's because they're talking climate action on one hand and they're um, allowing expansion of the fossil fuel industry on the other. We have to have the courage to regulate and to look at it as as a, a whole system, systemic issue. Last question on this subject before we turn to our last segment, and it goes in line with what Anna just said here. Do you think Canadians have the courage? Do you think Canadians have the courage to actually stand up and say, enough's enough, we, we realize that cli the cl climate crisis is one of the... Uh, biggest issues if not the biggest issues uh that is facing not only canada but the world today we need to start doing something do you think that we have the courage to do that or is and i say this with all respect to anyone who's listening and to, to our the candidates on but is it you screaming this into the void and just hoping that people will listen and i mean that with respect because We've heard this story over and over. We need courage. We need courage. But you look at the voting pattern in Canada, the courage seems to be there, but our politicians don't want to admit that it's there. So do we yeah. have the courage? I think we absolutely have the courage, right? We're looking. So our current first past the post system elects governments with like 30% approval ratings, right? Or 30%, 35% of the vote. But we're seeing many more Canadians than that screaming that literally the world is on fire, right? Our generation, the, I guess, Gen, uh, what's our generation again? The millennials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel so old right now. <laughs> Continue. But, you know, that's that, that's what we're talking about. We hear it in our campaign all the time when we're talking about, you know, social justice issues, which are intrinsically tied to climate issues. But now is the time to take bold action on climate. You know, the, the rising sea levels, the raging wildfires, the extreme weather events that climate scientists have been talking to us about for years are here today. It's not something in the future. We're experiencing them. We're living them. And so we believe that Canadians do want to see that bold change. We think that the incre incrementalism and inertia of the current governing, you know, parties is, you know, as it's, it's used as a way for them to dangle progressive policies in front of us, but never actually do it. You know what I mean? Justin Trudeau ran on moving away from fossil fuels. He ran on proportional representation. He ran on all these things, but he canned re proportional representation at the first at the first chance he got. He invested in more pipelines and and expanding the oil sands, as as uh, Anna was saying. Uh, you know, we talk about truth and reconciliation, but these pipelines, you know, they're going through First Nations lands, uh, whether they like it or not, with with very little. Uh, environmental assessment impacts or the ones that are done are largely ignored, right? Um, so the governments are acting, I think, in their own electoral interest and kind of using Canadians as, as sticks against e each other's parties. But we need to stop that. We need to be have a realistic long-term approach to how we plan for our energy, how we plan for our housing, and how we plan for the future of our democracy. And that begins by recognizing that we need to transition away from the old ways of doing things. We need to transition away from uh, fossil fuels towards renewable energies. We need to transition away from uh, you know, profit-based economic models to wellness-based economic models. And we need to start doing that now. And that's why we think that the Green Party has full potential to, to do that. Whereas the other parties have achieved their potential and are stagnating, we want to grow the party and we want to take it to the next level to be able to communicate to Canadians in a way that will be receptive to them, right? Because we hear you on the pushback, it's real. But we think that by engaging Canadians as the adults 
that we are and that they are and have a, a, a conversation, a serious conversation about how it is that we can move forward that, you know, where the tide rises all ships, then we'll be able to make the transitions we need to make and, and push the, the bold policy that is required for this moment. Anna, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, proportional representation is the solution here. Like one of the reasons that Canadian politics is not responsive to or representative of public opinion is because of first past the post. We have five parties in parliament and yet we are sticking with this, this electoral system that is designed for a contest between two. And if we want to move away from the extreme polarization and like creeping fascism that we see south of the border where we've got these two camps fighting against each other and seemingly living in different worlds. We need to look around the world and say there are better models of doing politics that are more stable and that involve more collaboration and more compromise and uh, proportional representation delivers that. I think there's actually a huge opportunity in just two days we're going to know you know who the the leader of the conservative party is going to be and i'm excited about the idea that the conservative party could fracture into multiple smaller ideological parties and perhaps some of them um, could support the idea of moving towards proportional representation we've already heard that from uh, michelle rempel garner um, that she believes conservatives need to start looking at the idea um, because you know it's really in in Justin Trudeau's interest to keep a fear-based voting system instead of you know a courage-based and values-based voting system, and that's why he broke his promise. So, you know, I I think Canadians are ready for big and ambitious changes on climate change, on social justice, on our electoral system, um, but it's Justin Trudeau who has by breaking that promise really kept Canadians in a box and, and are forcing them to make choices between the lesser of two evils rather than being able to vote their values. Um, I just looked at the clock and I know we are at the hour mark. We have just passed, passed the hour mark and I, 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 we had a full other segment, but I, I know I said an hour. So I'm going to leave with this last question. And this is to both of you, because um, we could probably talk for another three, four, five hours on these issues that are facing Albertans and Canadians. But you have other things you need to do. You need to go out and meet people. How can people learn more about your campaign? How can people reach out and ask questions that they have? And after that, and this is the preamble to the very last question, which is why you? Why should, pe why should people take out a membership of the Green Party and t put their trust in Team Walcott Keenan? So first off, how can people reach out? And then the last question, give us your pitch. You have two minutes and whatever you want to say. Why should people put their trust in you to be the next co-leaders, actually the first co-leaders of the Green Party of Canada? Whenever you want, whoever wants to start that. Perfect. I guess I'll jump in here. So uh, to find out more about our campaign, to get in touch with us, to volunteer, to donate, you can go to keenanwalcott.ca. Uh, you see our last names here in the in the chat, I think, or not in the chat, but in the, <laughs> on screen. So keenanwalcott.ca to find out about our policies, to find out a, bit, a little bit more about us and why us. Uh, both Anna and I have a long history of community engagement, of community involvement, of organizing, um, of fundraising. We know how to build movements and we know how to hand them off to the people so that they can take their, the things they want to see done in the world and do them. Our ethos is leading for, by example and building leaders who can then build other leaders. And that's why we think we're ready to take the Green Party to the next level and, that, and we're you know, part of the modern left and we're unapologetic about it. And we're ready to take bold ideas and put them in action for Canadians to better our democracy, to better our society, and to make, as we mentioned on a couple of occasions, that caring economy and that caring society that we need to move forward and address the crises of our time. Um, so that, I think that's my part of the minute. I'll pass it on to, to Anna. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on our website, keenanwalcott.ca, you'll find opportunities to, if, if you love us, you can share an endorsement, um, you can volunteer. We have you know, thousands of Green Party members' phone numbers, and so we want to make sure that we're contacting every single member. Um, for the next six days until September 14, um, you can sign up to become a member that allows you to vote in the two rounds of, of voting. Um, so please 
make sure that you are a member of the party if you want to vote and promote us recommend us to your friends and family let's let's you know develop the membership of the party until that september 14 deadline and of course we do need money so <laughs> please do donate um if you want us to be able to travel to your community and to to be present in person um you know donations are extremely welcome and there is a donate page that describes the the tax credit system that uh, can give you refunds for political donations. So, um, you know, please do consider donating. And yeah, I'll just back up what what Chad said, like, if you want to see a Green Party that's not focused on the cult of the leader, and that can succeed in building a broad, strong team across the entire country that's capable of getting, you know, running ambitious campaigns in 60 to 100 writings or more, and therefore getting 12 or 20 or 25 Greens elected. Um, if you're serious about building power, not just being a party of protest, but being a party of power, then you know, Chad and I are the leaders who are going to be able to get the Green Party to that next level. Well, I, I first want to say that the links to Chad and Anna's Twitter accounts, their campaign Twitter account, their campaign Facebook account, their campaign uh, Instagram account, their website, membership forms are on the show notes below. So if you are not a member and you've just heard something that you want to take out a membership and vote for Chad and Anna, mm -hmm. scroll down uh, and check it out because I highly recommend you get involved. I'm not saying you should go out and buy a membership. I'm saying... If you want to, the links are in the show notes because that's not my job. My job is just to bring the information to you as the host of the show. Chad and Anna, I want to thank you so much for this. I know we've ran over the hour mark, but I want to thank you so much for sticking with us. And uh, if you are out in Calgary, I will happily come out and shake your hand to say thank you for coming on the show and chatting with us and discussing the issues that uh, are important to the people of Canada. So thank you. Well, thank you for having us. And if you ever want us back, uh, you know how to reach us. <laughs> we certainly will. After round one, we will have you both back on as well. Um, so Excellent. with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in via YouTube, via our website. I want to thank everyone who is listening to this later on. And I want to remind everyone, as I say at every end of every episode, put down your social media account. Go have a conversation with somebody. Take five to ten minutes out of your day and go talk to somebody. It helps our democracy. It helps our society. And it helps us become a better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. This has been the Cross Border Interviews live with Chad and, uh, Chad and Anna. And we will be back later on on Friday for another full four hours of country music artist here in Calgary for the Canadian Country Music Awards. We will be back then. Talk to you later, guys. Thank you.